So we are in Matthew chapter 13 this morning. We're going to start a new series. Um, uh, I'm going to do a few topicals here. Things growing Christians should know is what I'm calling the series. And we're going to go over the parable of the sower um, this morning and uh, talk about that. So let's pray. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's go through and read this first. And then, then we'll pray and get into it. Matthew chapter 13, why don't you all stand? We'll go through and read it together. I will read it out loud and you guys will follow along. We used to do this thing where I would read one verse and, and the congregation would read the next verse and then I'd read the next verse and you guys didn't do that very well. <laughs> I'm sorry. Every, every time we would do it, people would come up and go, Steve, do we have to do that? You know, that's a train wreck. So that's why, that's why I'm the only one reading. And I don't do that well. Verse one, on the same day, Jesus went out of the house, sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables saying, behold a, par par excuse me, behold a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. End of sermon. That's all Jesus ever said to them. Yeah, that's all he said. And then he goes, end of sermon. Okay, I'm making a point here. Verse 10, it says, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received word among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. Let's pray. And Jesus says, we're going through your word. We pray that you would just give us ears to hear. Um, Lord, we don't want to just be listening to stuff and not paying attention. We, we just really want to hear from you, Lord. Thank you, uh, Father, for these people. Thank you for their desire for your word. We just pray that um, you'd bless them as we open it up and we hear what you have to say. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. So like I said, we're going to be doing a series uh, called Things Growing Christians Need to Know. I've been a believer for over 40 years now, and the, the stuff that I'm going to be sharing with you over the next uh, couple of weeks are things that I still look at in my own life to see how I'm doing with the Lord. And there are, there are issues in a believer's life, just the fundamentals, the basics that we need to be going over and be paying attention to all the time, or there's a chance that we can slip and we can fall and we can have, we can have some real problems. Um, the, the point that I'm, I'm making to you is, is this basically that, um, you know, th there, there are things in the Christian life that are like eating. And you guys eat all the time. You're, you know, we're going to get done with, with the study 
and you're going to be starved, and you're going to go out to lunch, or you're going to go home and, and, and fix lunch and that kind of stuff, and you're going to go eat. Do you remember what you had for lunch last week? Do you remember what you had for lunch the week before? Do you remember what you had for lunch on Wednesday? Do you know how many lunches you've eaten in your lifetime? Are you done with lunch? You know, how about dinner? You done with dinner? Never going to eat dinner again? Are you, are you looking at dinner and going, oh, no, I got to go eat dinner again? You know? No, we don't do that. And, you know, like I, like I said, you don't even know how many dinners, how, how, much, how much food you've eaten over your whole lifetime. You can try, sit there and try to calculate it 365 times three or four or five, depending on who you are, you know, that, and, and that kind of thing and try to figure that whole thing out. But you're not paying attention to that. And you're not, you're not looking at that like it's a chore. And there are things in your walk with God that are just like that. You're going to be dealing with exactly the same thing whether you are three years old in the Lord or whether you're 50 years old in the Lord. It's like eating a meal. And uh, it's not something that should ever be getting old to you. Um, it's something that, again, you have to do if you're going to remain strong. Now, Jesus' um, parable here is a parable on growth. And one of the things that everybody needs to know, every Christian needs to know as far as their growth with God is that you have a choice in this matter. You have a choice as to whether or not you're going to follow God, as, whether or not you're, as to whether or not you're going to succeed as a Christian. You have a choice as to whether or not you're going to end up in heaven. You have a choice on this. And God makes it clear over and over through Scripture. There's a passage in Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 through 20, where Moses is speaking. He says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And the passage goes on. You know, um, whenever, whenever I talk about this stuff, there are people who have this fatalistic idea that once they become a Christian, they've been put on cruise control or something. That everything that's going to happen in their life is going to happen automatically. And the Bible never teaches that. Never teaches that. Your life is different based on the things that you do or don't do. Your walk with God is going to be different based on the things that you do or you don't do. You're either going to have a, uh, an enjoyable walk with God where you're growing in him and falling more and more in love with him, or you may not have a walk with God at all. And that's the point that Jesus is making when he um, uses this parable there. Um, I have a part in this. Um, when, when I came into a relationship with God, I have a part in this. And you don't get to negate your part in the whole thing. There are times when the, when the stuff that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks are just totally natural and just totally a blessing and they're things that you want to do. And then there are times when they are a discipline and they need to be done. Just like there are times when I don't feel like eating. And yet, I'm, if I don't eat, I'm going to starve and I'm going to die, for example. Um, there's a passage in Philippians 2, 12 through 13. It says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but not now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You see that? I'm to work out my own salvation. It doesn't say work for my own salvation. It says, work out my own salvation. It's the idea that, again, I have a part in this. The, the verse it, it itself begins with an exhortation. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more my absence. Obey. And if you don't obey, then you know, there's going to be consequences of that whole thing. At the end of it, you, basically in that verse, and you see this every time that there is a verse talking about God's work in your life, there is a verse next to it that talks about the fact that you have to be involved in that. And in this verse right here, it talks about the fact that I need to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. And then it talks about the fact that it's God who's in me, that's in me, who works both to will, that's the want to, and to do, that's the ability of his good pleasure. And so I need to be involved in this, my will needs to be involved in this, but God's involved in the whole thing too. You know, um, the, the, this whole parable, 
is about the word of God and its effect in your life. And there are two things that Christians need if they're, if they're going to grow. And one of them is the word of God. That's your Bible. You guys got your Bibles? Yeah. Hold your Bible up. You got this. And then you, if you have the Holy Spirit at work in your heart, you've got everything that you need. You have all the things that you need for life and godliness, the Bible says. There's a passage in 2 Peter 1, through, uh, 1, 3 through 4 that says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What that means is God's given you the word of God and the things that are contained in this. You have everything that you need for life and godliness. So I, got, I have God at work in my heart. I have God's work at work in my head. And if I will take this stuff and I'll begin to apply it, my life is gonna be absolutely different and I'm gonna succeed as a believer. And if I don't, I won't. And that's just, that's just the fact of it. You know, one of, the, one of the things that we're always looking for is shortcuts. I want a shortcut. I just went up to Leavenworth this last week. Uh, it was our anniversary. And so, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that's awesome about a cell phone now is that you got Google Maps on it. And I don't, I don't know about the Apple thing. I know that it, it was getting you lost a couple of years ago. I think they fixed that. But Google Maps is awesome because you just plug the thing in and it tells you right where to go. Last time I went up to, to Leavenworth, uh, there's, a, there's a town up there. We went through the town and did all this stuff because I was just using a regular map. Google Maps showed me a shortcut. I love shortcuts. And so we're just cruising around this town and, and getting up there. And everybody wants a shortcut. Everybody wants things done easy and and uh, quickly and, and that kind of stuff. And there are th some things that have no shortcut to them. And this is one of them. You wanna grow as a Christian, there's things that, that are gonna have, have to be happening in your life. And so we have um, here the parable of the sower. Um, that's what Jesus called it, the parable of the so sower. It could be called the parable of the soils because actually what Jesus is talking about in the passage isn't actually the sower himself or even the seed. The sower is obviously the Lord working through people. The seed is obviously the word of God. What he's actually talking about is soils there, the different things that the seed fell on. And when you look at this, basically you have a situation where everybody who, uh, of everybody who hears the word of God, only one in four ends up following the Lord. One in four, 25%. Those aren't good odds, you know? It's like if I, if I was gonna go um, fly on a plane someplace and somebody told me, well, you got a 25% um, possibility of making it to the, your next landing strip. I wouldn't get on the stinking plane, that's crazy. Um, but that's what Jesus said about this whole thing. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is because there are times when people um, will talk to me about evangelism and you know, um, offering people opportunities to get saved and that kind of stuff, and, and uh, uh, many times people will have criticisms about this. I used to run this, into this all the time when uh, I was down at Harvest and uh, Greg would do uh, some of the evangelistic outreaches like the one that uh, he's gonna do tonight. And people would see all these people come up and get saved and then, you know, uh, people would come up with uh, statistics afterwards about how many of these people fell away. Well, here's the stats right here. 75% fall away. Actually, a quarter of them, 25%, never get it. They never understand in the first place. Of the people who actually respond, two-thirds of them walk away from the Lord. And those are the odds that Jesus gave at the very beginning. Is evangelism still worth it for the one third? Yeah, absolutely. And again, that's, that's the point of it. You know, when we do evangelism around here, we, um, uh, we try to follow up with people, um, give them a phone call. A lot of times we're trying to talk with you. You bring some, somebody to church here and they get saved, um, just so you know, we're gonna be talking to you so that you can have an influence in their life and make sure that they're getting plugged in in Bible studies and, and that kind of stuff. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep people um, who make a commitment to the Lord um, from just walking away or from falling away. But ultimately, what's gotta happen is they have to decide. 
You know, the day that I got saved, um, I really did get saved. And a counselor came up to me and talked to me. It was at Greg's church. He came up and talked to me. And um, I'm sitting there listening to the guy. And he's asking me if I have any questions. I don't know enough to have a question. Was, was what happened when I got saved. I didn't know anything. So I didn't know enough to have a question. I just had a big old smile on my face. I felt better and that kind of stuff. He called me um, about three or four days later and it was weird, frankly. Some dude calling me on the phone and I'm just one of those people. I don't know you. What are you calling me for? And I didn't say that to him. I was, I was polite to him, but that was my attitude towards him. And you know what? Um, uh, I didn't have anybody that came alongside me and helped me out and that kind of stuff. What I had to do was choose to follow Jesus. I had to choose. And God took me through a number of things to get me to that point. But there had, there had to be a choice in the matter. And that is... Um, absolutely the case with everyone. When we offer the gospel to somebody, what we're doing is giving them an opportunity to meet Jesus. What they do with that opportunity is up to them and the Lord. This is basically what it, what it, what it is. You know, we, we broadca broadcast the word of God here at Calvary. We obviously broadcast it on our radio station. We have a TV program. We're doing stuff on YouTube. We're doing stuff in, in all kinds of places. You know where the term broadcast came from? Sowing, sowing seed. When these guys would go out and sow seed, they'd, it was called broadcasting. They'd take it and they'd throw it out. It was a broadcast uh, with that. And so that's what we're supposed to be doing as believers. You know, what, what happens with the fruit, if I'm, if I'm sharing the word of God, what happens with the fruit is not my issue. The fact that I'm sharing the word of God is my issue. And it's the same thing with you. Sharing the word of God is your issue. What happens with it is not your issue. What, they, what has to happen is people have to take it, they have to um, impart it into their lives, and they have to grow in the Lord. Now, you can encourage people to do that, but ultimately, it's their choice on the matter. But at least they have a choice in the whole situation. That's what, that's what we try to do, give people a choice. So why do fall, some fall short? And... The, again, part of the reason that, uh, actually the main reason that people fall short is because there has to actually be an effort on their part. Sometimes people fall short because they're not really committed. There's a passage in 1 John 2, 19. It says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And I read that out of the King James Version because that's the one that actually matches the Greek. They were not all of us, is what it says at the end of that, that passage. In the context, it's talking about Antichrist, talking about false teachers and, and that kind of stuff. But it's true about people in general, too. Some people, they make a commitment to Christ, but it's not the real deal. They're not really going for it. They're, they don't really mean it when they said it. And they may be responding to all kinds of things, like all their friends got saved, that kind of stuff. But there's no real relationship between them and Jesus. And that's going to come out over time. If it's not real, it's not going to last. And so that's the first, the first point. Sometimes they're not really committed. Sometimes they're prodigals. You know what a prodigal is. Jesus taught about the prodigal son. And that's a guy who um, took everything that his father gave him and went out and wasted it. Basically ditched his dad, went out and wasted the, all the money that um, his dad had given to him, his inheritance, and he wasted it on what the Bible calls prodigal living. And it just means partying. So that's the partying son is basically what that, what that parable's about. And then what happens is he comes to himself, the Bible says. He's out there and he's got, he's got it bad and everything's falling apart. He's looking at pig slop and he wants to eat it. And the Bible says, Jesus said, that he came to himself and he said, it's better in my house for the slaves, the servants in my father's house have it better than I do. I'm gonna go back and ask if I could be a servant. And he gets up and he goes back to his father's house. And you know the end of the story. If you don't know the end of the story, go read John or uh, Luke chapter 14. In any case, he goes, he goes back to the father's house and, and God restores him. That happened to me. I walked away from Jesus and I got out in the world and I got a good, a, a, a real good taste of pig slop. And I decided this is no good. And I turned around and I went right back to my father's house. So sometimes when people leave, it's because they're prodigals. Here's a third class. Sometimes they've just left. Sometimes they just decided. And they, they know the score. They know what it means to follow Christ. And they just don't want to anymore. 
and they've left. You have warnings of that. There's a whole book of warnings in the book of Hebrews. Here's one, Hebrews 3, 12 through 13 says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And so you have those reasons. Um, Jesus goes on in this passage, and in verses 10 through 15, basically you see the fact that hearing from Jesus is a privilege. Like I said when I was reading the passage, all these guys heard, the crowd that was sitting there listening to Jesus, all they heard was a sower went out to sow, threw some seeds on the wayside, birds came and ate it, threw some uh, seeds on stony ground, the sun came out and cooked it, threw some seeds in thorny ground, the thorns grew up and choked it, threw some seeds on good soil, and it yielded fruit. End of sermon. That's what they heard. And then Jesus stops. Crowd disperses, and the disciples come up to him and go, what are you doing? Why are, why are you teaching these guys in parables? And the, basically the reason that Jesus was teaching these guys in parables is because they weren't listening. They weren't listening. So you see that, verse 11, he says, because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Doesn't that sound mean? So all the, the guys that have the stuff, you're going to give them more. And the guys who have nothing, you, you, they don't get anything. And, and even what they do have is going to be taken away from them. Look at verse 13. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And then later on, he quotes from Isaiah and says that these, the hearts of these people have become dull. They're not interested. And so he's not wasting his time. And it's not like Jesus started out this way. You know, most times when you hear about parables, uh, people will say, Jesus taught in parables so that he could explain things. No, there were times that he did that. But in this instance, Jesus taught in parables so that people might um, actually ask him a question, so that people might actually kind of be interested, so that you could weed out the people who could care less about what the word of God actually said from the people who were really interested and wanted to do something with it. All these guys had to do, and it's a multitude, all they had to do was walk up to Jesus and go, I don't get it. <laughs> you just talked to us about throwing seeds around, and I don't get it. And they didn't. And so what happened was, uh, Jesus just spoke to his disciples because they were interested. You know, one of the things that we need to be careful about is the fact that um, when we're hearing from Jesus, we're, when we're hearing from the word of God, this is an absolute privilege. And it's not something that you have to have. And it's not something that God's obligated to give to you. You need to keep it in mind. It goes on and in verse 17, talks about the disciples here. And it says, for, uh, or verse 16, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And then he, then he goes on with a passage. And basically what Jesus is saying to these guys is you're getting blessed in this way again because you listen, because you care about this stuff. And that's why I'm blessing you with this. And then he makes another point and says that you're blessed beyond what you actually think you're being blessed by. Because there were prophets that came before you that would have loved to be in your place. These guys were in the one time in history where God came down and where he was speaking to them face to face. And they were getting to hear all the stuff that we're hearing right now, not from Steve Winery's voice over a microphone, but from the voice of Jesus, the voice of God in, G in, in a human body and seeing and hearing it and hearing the inflections and seeing, seeing the face and everything that was going on with it. What an awesome time to be in. And you know what? Actually, um, we've got it even, you know, uh, uh, it's, I'm kind of even up on whether or not I would like to have been there at the first coming of Jesus or be where we're at, where, where we're about to see the second coming of Jesus. I don't know which one. You know, as far as, uh, as far as learning the word and stuff, I think I've got all kinds of advantages to these guys. 
because I got all kinds of books and you know I've got the whole Bible and it's not in scrolls and, and all, of, all of that kind of stuff. So I've got some real advantages. One of the things that we need to keep in mind as believers is um, some of us came out of the world. And again, you remember when you didn't have any of this? Remember when there was no Jesus? Remember when there was no Bible? Remember when it was just you and your family and everybody's doing whatever and it was all a free for all? You remember that? And now think about what you've got now. That's an awesome thing. And some of you grew up in Christian homes and so you, you've, you've had this all your life. It's kind of like, um, you know, I was just comparing it all to food. Uh, it, it's kind of like growing up in a, in a home where your mom is like a gourmet cook. You don't realize what you have until you leave your home. And all of a sudden you figure out what you had. And so your mom's like this awesome cook and every time you, you go down, you go to sit down and you eat and it's like, oh, this is really good. And that's what you're thinking. You're, oh, mom, very, very well done, mom. Thank you very much. That's very good. And, and that kind of stuff. Your friends are coming over and going, oh, my goodness, what is going on? Come on. <laughs> they're just stuffing their faces. And, they're like, and you're like, what is wrong with you? you know? <laughs> I have never seen food like this before. And you're just like, yeah, whatever, until you move out. And then somebody else is cooking for you. And all of a sudden you're like, well, this isn't how my mom cooked. And then you reap all the consequences of that too. You know, and, and that kind of stuff. You don't realize what you got until you don't have it anymore. And that's the situation that we have. It is an absolute privilege to be able to go through the Bible, hear the word of God, to hear Jesus talking to us. And, you know, just the time that we get to, get to spend in it and look at what Jesus does is awesome. And so don't take it for granted. So he goes through and he goes, here the, par the parable of the sower. And he begins explaining to them what the, what the different aspects were. And so the first one, he says, verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. So the wayside is just the path on the side of the, of the field. And basically the birds come and take it away. He says, that's like people who are drive-by hearers. That's what I call them. You know, it's like you just show up or you're, you just happen to be in a place and you hear some of this stuff and it doesn't have any kind of effect on you. It just goes over your head and you're not paying any kind of attention to it, all, to it at all. And um, basically, um, it's, it's not going to have an effect on you. He talks about the birds here. When I, when I, was, in, um, when I was younger, I, I lived in Big Bear, uh, California. It was a mountain uh, community and we had squirrels, just like we have squirrels here only there were gray squirrels. And so you'd, you'd set out uh, bird seed and stuff for the squirrels, they like that, and um, mostly what we set out is peanuts. And so you'd put out peanuts on the, on the deck rail and the squirrels would come up and sometimes they'd come walking over to you and they'd just take it out of your hand and stuff like that. The squirrels were real cute. But we had blue jays too. And, and blue jays, you know, they're beautiful birds, but they're obnoxious. They're just like, you know, just radically demanding and that kind of stuff. And you go out to feed the, feed the squirrels and the blue jays are you know, attacking the squirrels and you have a whole, you know, slew of blue jays. I don't know what a flock of blue jays is called, probably a flock, but <laughs> they all come up and they get the peanuts and chase the, chase the squirrels away and, and that, kind of that kind of stuff. They carry away small children and, 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 and those kinds of, they were just obnoxious, right? And whenever I think of this, that's kind of what I think of. So you've got people who are going along in their life and they just don't get it. Um, G, uh, the, the Bible's clear on the fact that Satan is absolutely opposed to you hearing and responding to the gospel. There's a, there's a passage in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4 that says this, but even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded. See that? God of this age has blinded their minds, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God should shine on them. Here, here it is in the NLT. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it's hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of, of God. And you know what? That explains people who, when you talk to them, about the things of God, they just get this glazed look over their eyes and it just goes over their head and they're like, what? That's, you know, there, there are people who come to church here and I know that they're coming to church because they're forced to. 
and they don't have any interest in the things of God at all. And usually, when I'm, when I'm teaching, they have their heads bowed like this. And I see you. You know? I'm looking. And I see you. So does God. And there's coming a time when you're going to be standing before him, and you're going to be um, uh, unpleasantly surprised by the events that are going to be taking place. Because every one of us is going to stand before God and give, a, give an account of their life. And what God is going to be saying to you is, what did you do with my son? Well, I didn't know anything about your son. You know, I never really had a good chance. And all I got, the preacher was boring. <laughs> and that kind of stuff. And God's going to sit there and he's going to, you know, press the button in the back of your brain. You have a button in the back of your brain. It's in the Bible. I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> He's going to press the button in the back of your brain and your whole life is going to unscroll. And every time that you've heard about Jesus, every time that you've heard the gospel, every time that you got an opportunity to respond to, to an invitation to come to Christ and you just went, no, or I'm not interested, or I'm too cool, I'm too cool for my shirt and I'm too cool for you. You know, that kind of, that kind of stuff, it's coming out and you're going to be seeing it. You don't want to be in that position. And so sometimes it's like that. There have been all, all these times when, when I've been sharing the gospel with people, just like one-on-one, -on -one, and they're like, I don't get it, I don't get it. And that can go on for weeks. And I'll be praying for a guy, and then all of a sudden, click, the eyes come open, the blinders come off, and all of a sudden he's understanding what's going on. There's a spiritual warfare that goes on, and Satan doesn't want you to have anything to do with the things of God. Next group. I, called them hard, I call, call them hard rock believers. Um, <laughs> he talks about the, the fact that, um, verse 20, but he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. But for when tribulation, that's talking about trials, hassles in your life, or persecution arises because of the word immediately, he stumbles. And so you, these are people who are fair weather followers. These are people who follow Jesus for a period of time, and maybe they're excited even, Jesus talks about that, even excited when they first give their life to him, but over a period of time, stuff starts happening, and they, don't, they didn't think that they signed up for it. Stuff starts happening, like he says, trials. Well, you know what? You're going to go through bad stuff whether you're a Christian or not. Did you know this? So everybody in my family is going to die. Everybody, they're all going to die. My son's going to die. My daughter's going to die. My wife is going to die. My grandma's already died. My mom's going to die. My dad's going to die. Everybody's going to die. And every time somebody dies in my family, I have a hard time with it. But I'm not alone. I have Jesus with me in the whole thing. And so when I look at those kinds of hard times, I'm sitting there looking at it going, I can go through this alone or I can go through, the, through this with the Lord. And I'd much rather go through, with, through it with the Lord, thank you. And that's what Jesus promised. In the world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world, is what he said. So don't expect that life is just going to be wonderful the whole way through um, being a believer. And you know what? I can tell you this. It's going to be way more wonderful than what you had before. Absolutely. I can tell you that. Maybe not at first. Because right at first, everybody starts picking on you. And that's what Jesus is talking about in that passage. These are people who, who say things like, I've tried Christianity, but it didn't work for me. Well, you know what? First off, we don't try Christianity. It's Jesus that we're coming to, not Christianity. It's not Calvary Chapel. It's not, you know, the teaching of the Bible. It's not any of that stuff. It's Jesus that we come to. And you don't try Jesus. The guy's not toothpaste. Jesus is somebody you commit your, your heart to or you don't. You either follow him or you don't. It's, it's that kind of commitment that God's called us to. G.K. Chesterton said this, uh, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and not tried. And that's usually the case with stuff like that. A lot of people, when they, they have this lifestyle where um, you can sell them anything. It's like they're just impulsive. And so you come up to them and you go, hey, this is a really good, oh, I'll take it, that kind of stuff. Impulsive buyers, you know, and sometimes they're buyers who buy things and they think that they're going to use them later on, but they don't. 
And so, you, you, you know, you, you exercise equipment, for example. People buy, how many of you bought exercise equipment this Christmas? Raise your hands. Nobody. Oh, back there. Where is it now? Does it have clothing hanging on it? <laughs> no, that's what people do. They buy exercise equipment and then you go in their house and there's clothes hanging all over it and, and that kind of stuff. And then pretty soon it's out in the, in the yard sale and that kind of thing. People who are excited for a while, but the first time that the life actually costs, they bail. That's what happens. I'm never, you know, overly impressed by people who rush into a relationship with God. You know who I like? I like the guys who need some convincing. And I'm not talking about necessarily people that you got to convince for months on end. I, you know, I don't mind that either. You know, the convincing can take a matter of minutes, but they're not just sitting there going after it just because, just because it's a fad or just because their friends are doing it. They're really thinking about it. And I see you when you do that too. I see it. So when I'm sharing the gospel with people and, and, and they're squirming in their seat and that kind of stuff and they, then they stop and then they lock eyes with me and then they're squirming in their seat some more. Those are guys that they're getting convinced stuff is happening there. And it's a, it's a very cool thing. Um, Jesus said this about following him. This is out of the NLT. Um, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, Yes, even, in, even your own life. And the point that he's making there is that the love you have for the Lord needs to be something that's so far above the love that you have for anybody else that it, the love you have for them is hatred by comparison. That's the point that he's making. He's not Satan saying, hate your mom and dad. Um, obviously not. But in any case, it's the idea of, you know, full-blown going for it. Jesus is my all. And he says, if you do not, otherwise you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, that, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he'll send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy's still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. And it's not the idea of you can't own things, it's that they can't own you. You're willing to give it all up for him. Um... One, one of the things, again, that happens with people is, is they have problems with following Christ because what they started out with was kind of an emotional experience with the Lord, and they were expecting all these things that God never actually said that he was going to give to them, like a carefree life. He never said that he was going to give that to them. And when something happens, they, they start having problems. Um, Jesus talked about persecution. By the way, the word persecution means to hunt, to chase you down. And there are times, this, this is what happened to me when I got saved. I get saved and all of a sudden people are hassling me and they're hassling me for one, or two reason, one of two reasons. One of the reasons they would hassle me is because they didn't like the fact that I became a Christian because it was making a statement about them. That's one of the reasons. And so they tried to make me fall and tried to pick on me and that kind of stuff. Tried to see if I was a hypocrite. Tried to see what I would do with that. That's hunting after me. Others didn't want me to leave. And again, the reason that they didn't want me to leave is because their it says something about their lifestyle. and They didn't like the fact that, that I could be different and they weren't. And so sometimes that's the issue. But in any case, um, people are going to hassle you. Jesus promised it. If you want to live godly in Christ Jesus, this is in Paul's epistles, you are going to suffer persecution. So just get prepared for it. It's going to happen at some point or another. And that may be somebody just giving you a hassle. We've got all kinds of people on the, on the planet that are being persecuted in ways that are just ridiculously over the top, so out there that any persecution that you ever go through in this country is silly by comparison. We have people getting their heads cut off for Jesus over in the Middle East. That's like real persecution. Somebody coming up to me and going, oh, Jesus freak, oh, you're a Christian. You're so close-minded, you're not very tolerant, as I'm intolerant of you. 
But in, in any case, you know, that kind, of, that kind of stuff, it's just nothing in comparison with what a lot of people are going through. And so, so sometimes that helps me out. You know, I'm not going through um, hardly anything. But in any, in any case, Jesus said, when you're persecuted, rejoice. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So when somebody hassles you for being a Christian, you need to rejoice over it because God's watching it and he sees it all and you're gonna get a reward that actually you probably don't even expect. You have no idea what's gonna be happening to you when you get home to heaven and you took that kind of garbage for Jesus. He's, he's grateful and he's faithful. And so you need to rejoice in those things. Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted. It means, oh, how happy. Literally what the word blessed means. So somebody's hass hassling me and I'm supposed to be happy. Not hassy, happy about the hassle, but happy about the fact that your life is different because if you were no different, nobody'd be hassling you. That's a good thing. And you can be happy about the fact that, again, God is watching that and that he's going to reward you for it. And you can also be happy about the fact that you can watch what happens in other people's lives when they're doing that stuff to you because God doesn't just let it go. And you can watch the hand of God in people's lives who are doing the hassling. It's a pretty cool thing. So there's lots to be happy about. Trials, persecution, that kind of stuff, that does not make a believer's walk weaker. It makes it stronger. And that's the way that it's supposed to go. I get stronger by the, by the things that I go through. So, you know, in this passage, it talks about the fact that there was no depth, um, that uh, there, were, there was no soil, um, that it's just like a seed sitting on a rock and it, and it blooms quickly but dies out quickly. And the reason for that, again, is because we need to have some depth in us. Like I said before, sometimes people get, when they get saved, it's just nothing but an emotional experience. How many of you had an emotional experience when you got saved? Raise your hands. That's awesome. I, I think it's totally valid to have that. I think it's a very cool thing. I didn't have it. You know, and actually, until after I got saved, I didn't have anything. I just had fear. <laughs> That's the emotion that I had going on when, when I gave my life to Jesus. And so I've known people who had an emotional experience and I've had known people who had none. How many of you had no emotional experience when you got saved? Yeah, and you're still here. So again, the point is that it's not based on emotion. This is one of those reasons that, you know, when, when people say, oh, Jesus is a better high than drugs ever were. Well, what if, he's, what if you get into a situation where you're not high on Jesus anymore? Are you going to bail? Are you going to walk away? The reason we follow Jesus is because what he said is true. Who he is is true. That's why we follow him. Now, I don't follow Jesus because I feel good. I follow Jesus because what he said is true. If you're following Jesus because of an emotional experience, as soon as your emotional experience goes away, you won't be following Jesus. If you're following Jesus because of a person, because my mom told me to, because my dad told me to, and that's fine, that's how things start, but you need to get your own. You give your life to Jesus when you're a kid, you, you know, usually everybody that I've ever known that's given their life to, to Christ when they were, they were a kid, there was a point when they got older, when they were making decisions all on their own and it had nothing to do with their parents anymore. It was just, I love Jesus and I'm gonna follow him. And that's getting your own. Sometimes people follow Jesus because their girlfriend got saved or because their boyfriend got saved. Well, what happens when you break up? You gonna walk away from the Lord? And it's not that God can't use that because he can't, but get your own. And sometimes people, you know, follow Jesus because this is an awesome church or I got an awesome pastor or because this person is the one who led me to the Lord. Well, what about if the church isn't so awesome anymore? What about if the pastor isn't so awesome anymore? What if you find out something about the pastor that you don't like? What about that, right? What if you find out something about the church that you don't like? Like there's hypocrites here. You know what? I'm a pastor. You think I don't know about hypocrites? <laughs> One of the things that I never do is introduce myself as Pastor Steve, ever. Now I get on a plane, I'm sitting next to somebody. I don't say, hi, I'm a pastor. Let's, let's have a talk. I never do that. 
I just have a talk with them. And they, if, they, if they ask me my name, I go, my name's Steve. You know, mom didn't, mom didn't put pastor in front of my name when I was a baby and stuff. My name's Steve, you know. Where are you from? Kennewick. Where's that? You know, that, that kind of stuff. And we have a conversation. And, you know, usually what, uh, actually this happens a lot of times. And it happened in construction all the time too. The guys will be cussing, rah, 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 you know, all the stuff's coming out of their mouth. And they go, hey, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a pastor. Oh. <laughs> And all of a sudden, the face changes. The mouth changes. Everything changes at that point. You know what that is? Hypocrisy. I'm no longer seeing the real person. Now I'm seeing what they put on in front of me. You think I don't know that there's hypocrites around? You think that there's not people who come up and say one thing to my face and another thing behind my back? My whole life as a pastor has been like that. And so obviously it's not supposed to be like that and we don't want to be like that. I don't, I don't think that there's all that many people that are like that here. Of course, I may not know what I'm talking about, huh? Right? I was a boss too, right? Actually, I'm, I am a boss now. And so I was a boss too. So you think that people don't act one way in front of the boss and another way behind his back? Yeah, I'm a dad. <laughs> <laughs> and all that stuff. You know, that's, that, that's where life is. That's how things go. And so if you're not going to follow Jesus because of what everybody else is doing, that's ridiculous. You follow Jesus. Jesus will never let you down. Jesus will never fall short. And actually, all these things that people get into, what they do is they make them kind of, they kind of put stuff on a pedestal. And so if you had, had an emotional experience when you first got saved, it's like, oh, all these awesome things happen. Heaven opened, angels appeared, you know, and that, and that kind of stuff. You start putting all that stuff on a pedestal and that becomes what you're about or the person, you know, it's like, oh, I just love this person because they're so godly and they've been such an influence in my life. And that, you know, and they, they, they start getting put up on a pedestal or a church or anything. You know what God's going to do? He's going to come over and he's going to knock your little pedestal over every single time, every single time. You know, um, Kyle was talking about Greg uh, being my pastor and that guy's got all kinds of integrity, but I, I you know, I know the guy. I, kn I know some of his faults. I know that kind of stuff. I've had people tell me um, faults that I never saw from him and I just thought those people were punks. But, you know, it's like I don't expect the man to be perfect. And he's followed Jesus the whole time that I've known him, and he's been faithful to do that. You know what's going to happen if he falls away tomorrow? You know what's going to happen to me? Nothing. I'll be bummed for him, but I'm still following Jesus because he didn't introduce me to himself. He introduced me to Jesus, and that's who I follow, right? And so you keep your head, head there, and you're going to be just fine. Here's a third, the third group, the people who choke. It says, now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Um, you know, the whole thing with choking, I, you know, I, I played sports and there were times when I choked. One of, one of my major times, well, I'll, I'll just kind of tell you. Um, I was in high school and I, I'm playing defensive end and they had moved me there from uh, wide receiver because I have, st I have hands of stone which means that every time I tried to catch a ball, it would just bounce off my hands. You know, the coaches would say, what, Winery, they hit you in the wrong spot? <laughs> you know, in your hands. And so I was no receiver. And so they put me on the, on the defensive line. And this one time my coach came up to me, my uh, defensive line coach came up to me, and he grabbed the, the uh, running back in the, in the backfield. He pulled him over in front of me. And so he's pulling him from the backfield, going this direction with him. And he goes, Winery, if you ever see a back going in this direction, you go out and you stand next to him and you'll get a touchdown. That's all he said to me. I was like, what? And then we moved on with practice. He didn't offer me an opportunity to ask questions or anything. He just said that. And so my senior year, I come up on a game and all of a sudden out of the backfield, I see this back come running over in front of me. And so I did what the coach told me. I went over and I stood beside him. I got beside him covering him. And all of a sudden he looked back towards the quarterback. I looked back towards the quarterback and five yards off is the ball. And I don't have time to react. And so I just reached up my hands, grabbed the ball and ran at 60 yards for a touchdown. It was awesome. The whole crowd was screaming, Rah! you know, we won the game, uh, you know, really, really, really awesome. So later on that year, we're playing a, we're playing a game against a, another 
team and my head coach really wanted to win this game really bad. And so we're playing against this team and I see the same thing. So the back comes out. Now, usually my, you know, the guy I, I'm on is the quarterback. He's the guy that I'm supposed to be watching. And I see the back going out and it's just, just, just like the split second decision process that's going on inside my head. I can either follow that back or follow the quarterback. And frankly, I kind of knew what was going to happen if I followed the back and I was a little scared of it. And so I figured maybe I can get the quarterback before he gets the ball off. And so I ran towards the quarterback and he saw me coming and he just went bloop, right over the top of my head and they got like 30 yards on that run. And the next Monday, we're in films, and my head coach goes, Winnery, what were you doing? Why, did, why didn't you follow the back out there? And he really wanted this game. And if I'd have got, if I'd have, we tied it. So if I'd have got it, broke up the, if I'd have broke up the play, it was, it was third down. If I'd have broke up the play, we probably would have won. If I'd have caught the ball and ran it again, we certainly would have won. And he wanted the game. And he said, Winnery, what, what were you doing? And I just go, I don't know, coach. I choked. And that's what happened. I knew what was going to happen, and I was afraid of it. And I was more comfortable doing, doing something else. And so what I did was I choked. You don't want to choke with Jesus. You want to, you want to follow all the way through. It talks about weeds choking out the, um, the fruit in, in these guys. You know, weeds don't grow up overnight. You know what I mean? It's not, this is not a picture of, you know, these people are going along and everything's hunky-dory and everything's fine and stuff. They're just, they're, they're just going, along, going along and all of a sudden this weed pops out of the ground and say you're a little flower. You're a flower growing there. And the weed pops out of the ground and, and it reaches over to you, grabs you by your little flowery neck, wrestles you down and start, start pulling petals off and that's not what happens with weeds, right? So what happens is they kind of grow up together. And a lot of times the weeds can grow up later than the plant itself. And they look pretty innocuous when they first start growing. But as they get fed and as, as they grow more, what ends up happening is they take out the space that the flower, or in this case the, the, the um, grain, had to grow and they choke it out. Um, Jesus doesn't say in this passage that it was sin that choked these guys out. He said that it was the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. And let me just say this right off the bat here. God, God wants you to take care of certain things. My family is important. I need to be taking care of it. I need to have a place to live. That needs to be happening. Um, in my case, I need transportation. That needs to be happening. There's all these things that are going on in my life. I gotta pay the electric bill. There's all, all this kind of stuff going on. I'm raising kids and all that kind of stuff. All that stuff is going on. It's not supposed to choke out the word of God in my life. It's not supposed to choke out the work of God in my life. You know, there are, are people who are not, um, not going to church any, or not reading the Bible, excuse me, anymore because they don't have any time. That's one of those things that Satan will do with you is try to use up your time so that you can't use it in the way that God wants you to do it. Does God want you to read your Bible? Will your life be different if you do? Yeah, it will. Does God want you to um, look at Facebook? I don't know. Right? Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's not so good. Right? So does God want you on Instagram all day long? Yeah, what's that? Mike said, what's that? <laughs> it's this picture thing. They put pictures on for family and stuff. You know, there's all these things that, that, that take up your time and start choking things out. Does God want you watching TV all day? You know? And uh, TV's not bad. But when it becomes something that starts choking out the word of God in your life, then it becomes an issue, doesn't it? And so people, you know, a lot of times when people are starting to get into this position, they'll, they'll go through and read their Bible, but they can't wait to get done with it so they can get onto something that they actually want to do. You're getting choked at that point. Same thing with going to church. We all know that going to, going to church doesn't save you, right? But you know what going to church does? It keeps you from falling away. The Bible says that we're not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together as is the habit of some, and even the more so as we see the day approaching. What we're supposed to be doing is encouraging and exhorting each other um, uh, uh, into love and good works. And it's one of those things that keeps you accountable. 
And so you start, you start bailing on church, um, I can already tell you where you're going to go. And this is one of those things that you have to make a decision about in your life. You don't compromise these areas. You're not that strong. I've been a Christian for 40 years. I'm not that strong. So you don't compromise in these areas. And one of the things that will happen with people is they start getting a busy life and they go, well, I don't need to go to church all that much. And, you know, after all, God is, you know, God is everywhere. And so I can go out and I can be on the, on the river and fishing and that kind of stuff. And that's how I worship God and, you know, and creation and all that kind of stuff. Really? You know, I've been with lots of fishermen. I've never seen them stop and pray. Ever. Unless they're going praying for fish. <laughs> I don't see them singing worship songs. I don't, I've never seen them doing anything like that. You know, and, uh, obviously that's just nothing but a big fat excuse. You know, when I uh, first got married, um, I was going to Sunday morning, Sunday night, and I was serving at both those services. And then Wednesday night was the night that I got, I got fed. That's where I'm just going to go and sit down. And I'm listening to the Bible studies otherwise too, but that, that was my time where I'm just going to focus on the word and stuff. And so I, so I get married and my wife comes up, and I was doing a couple other Bible studies during the week too. Um, and I get married, my, my wife, one of the first things that she said to me was, well, we don't need to go to church all that much. We don't need to go on Wednesday nights. And I said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I said other stuff that was really stupid, but not that. <laughs> And she was a young believer, and so you know, I just talked to her, and I just went, you know, Sunday morning is when I, I serve, and I serve Sunday nights, and I'm going to keep doing that, and Wednesday nights is when I'm getting fed. We're not going to stop. And uh, um, I did, I did um, stop going to a uh, Friday night Bible study uh, and spent time with my wife and stuff. But, you know, um, there are things, again, Satan wants to choke things out. Having children is not a reason not to go to church. Having a job is not a reason not to go to church. Um, you know, getting busy is not a reason not to go to church. You know, the, the, we come together on a Sunday morning specifically because we're honoring and we're um, celebrating the fact that Jesus, who saved my life, rose from the dead. And we're here to worship him. Same thing with, with praying. You know, one of the first, thing that goes, the first things that goes is your prayer life. And... Any effective prayer life is what I'm talking about. You may still say prayers, but they're cold and they're distant and that kind of stuff. And again, it's because these things get crowded out. And so you don't want other pursuits to crowd out God. God, God says if it, that if you'll seek him and his righteousness, seek his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. If you seek all the things and stop going after God's righteousness in him, you're going to lose it. And sometimes you lose all the things too. These, you know, when you're talking about people like this, these are people who used to be here all the time, but slowly they begin coming less and they have their reasons, their excuses and stuff. And then pretty soon you don't see them at all. Then you find out that they're getting a divorce or your friend, you know, ju just junk is going on in their life. And it's because they got choked out. There's a guy named Demas who was mentioned twice in the Bible. The first time that he's mentioned by Paul, it's in a really good way. And how'd you like to be mentioned in the Bible? You know, if Paul mentioned me in the Bible, I'd go, hey, have you picked up the book of 1 Corinthians lately? <laughs> Steve Winery, right there. You know, <laughs> right there. 2 Timothy, though, Demas is mentioned a second time, and it's not so good. And what Paul says is, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. How'd you like that about you in the Bible? And that's, again, an example. And then finally, you have the fruitful hearers, and hopefully that's where we're all at. Key to growth in the Christian life is getting as much of the word into your life as possible. And he says, he who received the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word, understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. You know, um, one of the things again that, that will keep you from receiving the things that God wants, wants for you is this whole thing with hearing and actually listening. Have you ever gone to dinner with somebody who's texting? Ever had to try to have a conversation with somebody like that? And it's like, you know, you're, you're, they're sitting there texting and pretty soon you're just like, eh, you know, I'm not going to talk to you until you're done. Sometimes my kids do this with me because I'll, I'll, I'll be getting texts and stuff and, and I'll, I'll be looking at it and, and, you know, they'll get done and I'll say, say all that again because I didn't get any of it. <laughs> you know, go back over it. And so 
they'll, they'll do stuff like that to me. Um, in any case, it uh, goes in one ear and out the other. And uh, sometimes that's what happens with the word of God. There's a story about Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, he got tired of the whole glad handing thing. You know, he had to stand in lines with receptions and stuff like that. And people would come by and say all these things to him. And he got tired of it because it didn't seem like anybody was actually listening. So he decided this one time, and this is a story. I don't know if it actually happened, but it's a good story. I don't care if it happened or not. <laughs> he, he, he decided this one time that he was gonna say something off the wall to people when they came up to him. And so they'd come up to him and they'd shake his hand and he'd, wh and he'd whisper, I murdered my grandmother this morning. <laughs> they go, oh, Mr. President, that's so nice. Oh, it's so good to see you. I am so, you know, I am so happy to be here. And he'd go, oh yeah, yeah, okay. And then they move on and go to the next person. I murdered my grandmother this morning. <laughs> and they do exactly the same thing. And he did it through this whole line until a diplomat came up and he says that to him again, I murdered my grandmother this morning. And then the, the diplomat stops and looks at him and goes, Mr. President, I'm sure she deserved it. <laughs> He's the only one who's listening. And you know, success or failure in the Christian life is dependent on how you hear the word. So are you hearing it? Are you taking it in? Are you listening to what it says? Are you doing your best to apply it? And um, when, you, when you do it that way, you become strong. And here's another thing. Healthy people are hungry people. And the Bible talks about this hunger for the word of God that we're supposed to have. Um, and if you don't have the hunger, it means you're sick. You know, you go to the doctor and one of the first things that he's gonna ask you if you're having problems, how's your appetite? And if your appetite is messed up, he's, he's going he's gonna to know that there's an indication there. There's something going on there. And it's the same thing with your appetite for the word of God. If, if what you're doing is trying to get through reading the Bible so that you can get on to other things, there's stuff that's wrong at that point. You're sick. And you're in, you're in danger of being somebody who's choked out and that kind of stuff. A healthy Christian is going to be hungry for the word of God. And a person who's taking God's word into his life is going to be strong. And it's, just a, it's exactly the same thing with food. In fact, the Bible compares itself to food. And so you take food in, you're going to get stronger. If you don't eat, you're going to get weak. One week without reading your Bible makes one weak. W-E-A-K, right? And what you want to do is, is get strong. You know, we have need of endurance, we, we need to be people who can, who can hack it through things. And when the, when the persecutions come to a person who's in the word of God, then what he's gonna be able to do is dig in and outlast the enemy. You know, uh, when, when a platoon or a group of men are being attacked, um, there are times when they have to dig in and actually, I got, I got rebuked after first service because I was talking about foxholes. One of the guys in the military came up to me and said, they're not foxholes, they're fighting holes. <laughs> foxholes are what you hide in. Fighting holes is what, you, is what you hunker down in until you can get up and move. You know, you, you fight from a, from a strategic position. And he was all into that. And actually, I am too. <laughs> That's exactly how it's supposed to be. But when the persecutions come, you dig in, you outlast the enemy, and you hack it through things. And if you're not healthy, that's not gonna happen. You know, there's a passage in 2 Timothy 2, 3 that says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There are times when you're gonna go through hard times and it's just part of the territory and you have to be able to make it through. Um, there are some people that just frankly need to, need to toughen up and stop being a wimp. You need to toughen up. And you, you just walk with God again because it's true. You know what, people in the world spend their lives on causes that are limp and weak and wrong and ultimately self-focused. And what we have is something that's true and righteous and good, something that lasts forever, something that makes us love others more than ourselves. And we need to be strong about it. Frankly, again, there, there are way too many timid Christians running around and that's not what God's called us to. We need to be people who are strong, people with integrity, people who will stand up in the face of whatever and live for Jesus. So which are you? You know, I don't think that there's many people who have the seat on the wayside. Otherwise, I don't know if you would be here, but maybe you are. You know, maybe somebody dragged you into church and, and stuff and you're, and you're watching and praying. You're watching your watch and you're praying that I'll get done. 
and you're in danger of losing out on the best thing that could ever happen to you. Some of you um, have been seed that was on rocky ground and you were excited right at first and you're in danger of walking away because it's getting too hard for you. And again, you can go through the hard things by yourself or you can go through the hard things with Jesus. Which one do you pick? I know which one I pick. Um, some of you may be being choked out by the stuff. And again, you can't get wait done, or you can't wait to get done reading your Bible so that you can move on to the stuff that you really enjoy. You're getting choked out. And that needs to change. And some of you are on good soil, good soil, excuse me. You're bearing fruit and you're growing. And some of you may have never made any kind of commitment at all. Some of you may be people who have never heard this stuff before. You just walked in the building for the first time and you're hearing this stuff for the first time. And uh, that's who I wanna talk to right now. You know, Jesus talked about having a new life. He talked about being born again. He talked about the fact that you don't have to live the way that you've been living your whole life, that you can have peace in your heart, that you can have a joy that's just overwhelming. And it's not gonna be there all the time in the sense of everything's gonna be happy. I already talked about that. But you can have a different life than what you've got now. And Jesus talked about the fact that the reason that you have the life that you've got now that you don't like so much is because of sin. And not just the sin of other people, it's because of your sin too. You've been making choices and doing things that have not only caused harm to you, they've caused harm to people around you and you start getting the consequences and it's like this whole cycle that buries you. And Jesus said, you can stop it. You can break the chains. You can get free and have a new life. And that comes through confession of sin and a commitment to follow him. I already talked about that too. Jesus said that you have to love me more than you love anybody. That's what he's going after. He wants you and all of you and not any little parts left behind. He wants all of you and he's willing to take you. Well, the thing, that, thing, thing that's cool about Jesus, you know, there have been people who wanted me on their, on their team uh, um, in whatever, in business or in sports or whatever I was doing, they wanted me on their team. And there have been times where I looked at him and I go, and I, I, and I thought in my head, I don't know if you know what you're doing. <laughs> I don't know if you really want me on your team. I don't know if you know what my flaws are or not. You know? and, I, and I would think that way. Here's the cool thing about Jesus. He wants you and he knows you. He knows all about you. He knows you better than you even know yourself. And he still wants you. There's not a sin that, that can keep you out of heaven except for rejection of Jesus. Every other sin is forgiven. And so you need to make a choice. You need to decide whether or not you're gonna follow the Lord. Some of you may have, uh, you know, like I said, may see yourselves in certain areas of that parable that aren't good. And you need to recommit your heart to the Lord. And I would just suggest that you do that. Just get things straight with him. God, God does not want you to fail. He does not want you to be choked out. He does not want you to walk away. And he's gonna be moving heaven and earth to keep you. So you just need to make a decision. I'm gonna pray right now. And um, when I pray, I'm gonna ask those of you who don't know, if you died today, would you go to heaven? And if you don't know that, you need to know. And you know that you need to make a commitment to the Lord. I'm gonna pray for you. I'm gonna ask you if you wanna do that to raise your hand. And then afterwards, I'm gonna ask you to stand up and pray a prayer with me, committing your life to Christ. And those of you who need to make a recommitment to the Lord, you just be thinking about it too, because this is a time to do that also. And you can pray and recommit your heart to Jesus and your life to him totally. So let's pray. You'd be thinking about that while we're doing this. Jesus, again, we come before you and thank you, Lord, again, for, the, for just how clear your word is. I, I like it, Lord, that you have things for us because we're interested. I like it that you treat us like adults and people who don't care, um, you don't force it on them. But people who do, you make it absolutely clear so that they can make a real choice. And God, there are people in this room right now making choices. So Lord, I just pray that you would help them to finally give their lives over to you, finally say yes to you, finally say, I don't know, just make it right with you, Lord, and just walk out of here changed. And while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if you're here this morning, you don't know if you're going to heaven, you don't know if your sins are forgiven, 
and you want to know Jesus, you want to follow him, if that's you, why don't you raise your hand up? I'm going to pray for you. You need to raise it up high so I can see it. This is your chance. Up in the front. God bless you. Anybody else? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You guys are adults. You get to choose. But Jesus can change your life right now if you would like him to. You can have heaven. You can have a new life. You can have peace in your heart. You can get rid of your junk. You want Jesus? Anybody else? Raise your hand up high. Okay. Anybody who needs to recommit their life to the Lord? Would you raise your hands up? Yeah, I see you. God bless you. In the middle there on my right, God bless you. Okay. Let's pray. God, I just, again, pray for these and ask that you give them the boldness to stand for you. And ask that you do this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys want to look up at me? You guys that raise your hand? What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray a prayer with you. And this is just going to be a prayer committing your heart to Jesus. And um, again, this needs to be something that's between you and him. I'll give you the words to say, um, but you do this. The Bible says you call on the name of the Lord and he'll save you. That's, that's what he's about to do with you, okay? So why don't you guys just stand up right where you're at and let's pray. And pray this out loud after me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I know that I'm a sinner and I've sinned against you. I'm sorry. Please write my name in your book of life and make me a believer. I thank you that you love me, that you died for me, and that you rose again from the dead, and that you're coming back for me. Please fill me with your spirit and give me the power to live for you. I want to give my whole life to you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right.